Sir Roger Gale. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I stand as the chairman of the all-party group for frozen pensions. That is a body that ought not to exist at all. But unfortunately, its presence is necessary and has been for some time. It is to the eternal shame of successive governments that there is a group of United Kingdom citizens living in Canada, Australia, South Africa, the West Indies, and other far-flung places who are entitled to United Kingdom pensions, but have seen those pensions frozen since they left the UK for foreign parts. That is wholly unacceptable. These people, men and women, have in very many cases served their country, country long and honorably. They are former members of the armed forces, they are former diplomats. They are people who have given public service. And they are those who have paid their way in the United Kingdom. And then in later life, moved to live with families overseas. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this issue was raised briefly in the previous debate. It is the case that a pensioner living in Canada, a United Kingdom pensioner living in Canada, has a pension frozen, sometimes for many years, in the case of Anne Puckridge has been cited. A few hundred yards across the Niagara Falls in the United States, that same pensioner would have their pension uprated in line with inflation, as we have heard today from the minister that other pensions in the United Kingdom are quite properly uprated. The reason that this situation persists is because successive governments have sheltered behind the opinion that because there is no reciprocal arrangement with another country, it is not necessary for the United Kingdom to pay the full pension. That has led to the disgraceful circumstance where, for example, in Canada, the state, the Canadian state, finds itself having to top up the funds payable to a United Kingdom pensioner in order to enable them to live. I believe that this is, as I have said, a shame upon our society. During the last year, the All Party Group researched the circumstances of very many pensioners living overseas, sought the advice of the Canadian, the Australian and other governments, sought the opinion of parliam parliamentarians and the speakers of their houses. And shortly before Christmas, we published our findings. That report is a damning indictment of what the government of the United Kingdom has allowed to prevail for far too long, long. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Canadian government specifically has indicated very clearly that it wishes to enter into a reciprocal agreement with the United Kingdom. In a note, a background note to a parliamentary question, a government document says that officials have received a letter from the Canadian Federal Department responsible for leading the negotiation of Canada's international social security agreements. The letter seeks to conclude a social security agreement between Canada and the United Kingdom. Officials have acknowledged the letter. So it is a matter of record, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the Canadian government has sought to break the ice, has made the move, has offered to negotiate a reciprocal agreement with the government of the United Kingdom. 
In a written answer on the 3rd of December, the pensions minister acknowledged that these representations had been made and indicated that a full response would be forthcoming. That was in December. We are now two months further on. I want to know, please, from the minister this afternoon, what proposals are being brought forward by the Department for Work and Pensions and the Government of the United Kingdom to enter into serious, serious, meaningful and substantive negotiations with the Government of Canada so that at the very least that wrong can be put right? And I would like to think, Mr Deputy Speaker, that that will be a step towards proving that this Conservative government is taking steps to right the wrongs of the past. Thank you. Roger. David Linden. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I start by uh, indicating my thanks uh, to the Minister for his very kind words at the uh, beginning of his speech. It's much appreciated and I look forward to, to working with him in this new role. Um, Last week, people across the British Isles rightly came together to mourn the passing of a remarkable gentleman, Captain Sir Tom Moore, a war veteran who served his country and lived to see his 100th birthday. Now, honouring pensioners and valuing them for their contribution to our society is something the UK does very well with words, but perhaps less so with actions, and that's particularly the case when it comes to pensions. It is, Mr Deputy Speaker, an inescapable fact that the United Kingdom has one of the worst state pensions in Europe, and I believe this shows just how much the British government values older people who have worked their entire lives, paid their taxes, and now find themselves struggling to get by on a relatively low state pension compared to their peers on the European continent. But as the Honourable Gentleman, a member for North Thanet, has just outlined, the situation is even worse for pensioners who have moved abroad. Older people who have chosen to join family members overseas have found that their pensions have been frozen at the same rate as it was when they first became entitled, or indeed the date in which they left the UK and were already in receipt. And the reason that I spoke about Captain Sir Tom Moore is because frozen pensions particularly adversely impact veterans who live overseas. Bernard Jackson exemplified the injustice of Britain's frozen pensions. Bernard fought in World War II and participated in the D-Day landings as a wireless operator in the Royal Air Force. He moved to Canada with his wife to their dream home. Now, sadly, after his wife died, Bernard was forced to return to the UK because he could not live on his frozen UK state pension of just £48 per week. He served his country in its darkest hours, yet he was forgotten by the UK government, with this neglect forcing him to leave his dream home. Now, after his return to the UK, he continued to campaign against the injustice of frozen pensions to ensure that nobody else would suffer as he did, and sadly, he passed away in March last year. But for those of us who have been following the injustice of frozen pensions, eh, though there has been an encouraging proposal from the Government of Canada eh, to implement a reciprocal agreement and end the injustice of frozen pensions for the 150,000 UK pensioners who live there. So I would argue that it is now incumbent upon the British government to open negotiations with Canada and rectify this moral injustice, because failure to do so and leaving UK nationals abroad in poverty would send an awful signal for what is now meant to be global Britain. But it is not just overseas pensioners who face... Mr Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, um, I... I um First welcomed in March 2016 the announcement by the government that those reaching the state pension age between 6 of April 2016 and the 6th of December 2018 would receive a fully indexed public service pension for life. I further uh, welcomed that in January 2018 it extended these arrangements uh, for those reaching state pension age by April 2021. Indeed, that government is currently consulting uh, uh, on further extension. I look forward to seeing the outcome of the consultation on the further extension of the full indexation policy, especially in light of the McLeod uh, judgment. I, I would, what if I could, Madam, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, just, just very quickly refer to the to the frozen pensions as the right honourable member. Quickly refer to the to the frozen pensions as the right honourable member for North Thanet and the honourable member for Glasgow East both referred to. Uh, as the minister on frozen British pensions revealed that both the Australian 
and indeed the Canadian governments have been calling on the UK to end this policy for many years. Um, since that report was done just last year, the Canadian government has, has formally requested a reciprocal social security agreement covering the uprating of pensions with the UK. Um, Ever mindful of, of uh, what someone uh, what would be referred to as an immoral frozen pension policy for the 150,000 UK pensioners affected who live in Canada, the impacts of this policy can be devastating. And since Canada pay their Canadian pensioners that reside in UK their full pension, the agreement would simply provide UK pensioners in Canada with the same rights as their counterparts in the UK. Uh, others have referred to it, and, and I feel it's important to put it on record, one such pensioner is 96-year-old World War II veteran Anne Puckridge, who served in all three armed forces, but receives a meagre £72.50 a week of the £134.25 a, state, uh, a week state pension she is owed. This is all because she moved to Canada at 76 to be closer to her family. Peggy, uh, Peggy Buchanan, served in UK Canada from 1946 to 1948, where she helped to break the German Enigma codes, has also denied her full UK pension. She now lives in Canada. And as a right honourable member for North Thanet referred to, had Peggy family settled two miles further south in the USA, then Peggy's pension would not be frozen. So the unjust frozen pension policy that denies half a million UK pensioners who paid into the system their full UK state pension is a national shame, I believe. And others believe that it's been allowed to continue by successive go the co governments for decades. It is not right, I believe. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that UK pensioners um, are punished for moving to Canada, often to be close to family uh, with a frozen pension, and often because it's for due, due to health reasons and health circumstances. Uh, and, and, and again, I'm always very mindful of the close ties between these countries. Um, and as one who, uh, at the very young age of 18, emigrated to Canada uh, and then returned back again, uh, I, I know of the close uh, cultural, historical and social uh, ties that, uh, that the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland have with Canada. The recent inquiry by the all-party parliamentary group of frozen British pensions found one in two frozen pensioners receive a UK pension of £65 per week or less. Many veterans and former public servants who have given so much to this country are now struggling on a frozen pension. So again, I would just underline that the Government of Canada has now presented an opportunity, I believe, to rectify a moral injustice that sees thousands of UK pensioners in Canada denied the full, K, full UK state pension they paid into. And I believe that, that every UK state pensioner should receive a full up, uh, upgraded UK state pension, regardless of where they live. I wish also to clarify, if I can, Mr Deputy Speaker, that this legis legislation before us today will enable us to continue to do right by those who have worked hard all of their lives and expect expectation that they will be treated fairly and not as a stopgap to simply put off doing the right thing for another four years. It has to be remembered that every year we put off, for that every year we put off is a year that many have died without receiving what they have, I believe, been entitled to. Surely we must bring forward in a more comprehensive way. And I look forward to, to that happening soon now that the consultation has ended. I look forward to the Minister's response. I believe there are many issues that still need to be sorted. But thank you very much, Mr. The Honourable Gentleman for North Thanet uh, raised a, an issue both in the previous debate and this debate in respect of overseas pensions. He will know, sadly, that the policy on uprating of UK state pensions paid overseas has been the policy of successive governments of different political persuasions for over 70 years since World War II. I, I do not uh, have good news to tell him, I'm afraid. There is no intention that I'm aware of for this government to change this policy.